Bob if the U.S.-based National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is known as NOAA, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service established policy or regulations concerning allowable copper concentrations in water? This is not generally the case because NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service do not have this authority. Instead, EPA and the states have the primary authority to regulate chemicals in lakes, streams, and oceans under the Clean Water Act. So agencies such as NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service, they do play a minor role in that they're able to review these criteria and provide their biological opinion of whether criteria are protective. But this review step, which is also known as a consultation, only occurs if the federal action or the Clean Water Act standards in this case have the potential to directly affect threatened and endangered species. So, Bob, is that the reason why NOAA has taken particular interest in this topic? Yes, they have, Scott. I think the main reason they've taken the interest in it is they believe that the resources are not being protected at levels that are set forth as protective under the Clean Water Act. But as you will hear many times throughout this podcast, the ICACD teams collectively feel the current regulatory frameworks developed and implemented by the Clean Water Act by EPA and the states is fully adequate to support a uh, population of salmon and trout. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the studies and the papers that have been shared by uh, our scientific experts regarding copper and its impact on aquatic life. I know that in Scott's compendium there are many. Joe Gorsuch, can you describe a few of the key studies, their significance, and the impact they've had on the scientific community, the copper, and even perhaps the general public? Happy to describe some of our efforts uh, in the freshwater studies using salmon. Working with our expert science team, we are evaluating studies from several different sectors, including the government, academia, the ICA, and NOAA lab studies. We're evaluating these studies and putting them into perspective. To give you some background, in 2010, I brought a group of scientists together to form what is now known as the Copper Olfactory Behavior Advisory Group. Studies and three symposia were organized as part of our ongoing communications to stakeholders, including regulators and the scientific community. Joe Meyer, please describe some of the studies that you have co-authored with our colleagues and their significance to the copper industry. Members of the advisory group I've conducted several analyses related to this topic. As a result, we've published eight papers in scientific journals and symposium proceedings, and we've presented 30 talks or posters at scientific meetings. In fact, in 2013 and 2014, our papers in the symposium proceedings of the annual meeting of the Society of Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration received outstanding paper awards in the Environmental Division. The simple take-home message from our publications and presentations is regulatory limits based on bioavailable copper, such as using the BLM-based copper criteria, would be protective against olfactory effects in fish, both in the ultra-pure laboratory waters that I discussed earlier and in a wide range of natural waters out in the real world. Moreover, some of the scientific research that originally contributed to the concerns about copper-based olfactory effects has recently acknowledged the ability of dissolved organic carbon, one of those important water chemistry components I talked about, to protect and to decrease the bioavailability of copper and thus protect against effects of copper to aquatic organisms. Therefore, we're making headway in having researchers and regulators understand that water chemistry matters for the toxicity of copper and other metals, and that bioavailability should be taken into account when setting regulatory limits. We also have been active in other PR outreach and educational programs. Uh, Opportunities included information sharing of outside the science community. These are activities such as the CDA newsletter, presentations to our ICA and CDA members, the Copper Talk blog, and outreach to media where appropriate. You've done a lot of these studies. You've made quite a few presentations. Have you begun to change the minds of your colleagues in the scientific community? And if so, what changes have you seen? Our uh, presentations in particular uh, have reached a number of the scientific community, which include most stakeholders, the government as well as some of our academic colleagues. And they have recognized the fact that the 
water chemistry matters message is important, and they are looking at, in particular, the organic content of streams and recognize that the organic matter binds most copper, making it unavailable or non-toxic to all aquatic organisms, not just to the impact on salmon. So I think, yes, we've made huge progress and successes, and I, I'm pleased that our colleagues in the scientific uh, conferences have acknowledged this. Joe, have you received a good response from scientists in the regulatory community as well? If you take a look at the Bristol Bay Watershed Assessment that U.S. EPA recently conducted up in Alaska, when they talked about salmon and the potential effects of copper, they very specifically stated, quoting directly from our publications, that as long as the water quality criteria for copper were not exceeded, there would not be effects on the fish, the salmon, and the trout, including olfactory impairment effects. And I'll follow up with a possible observation and also in support of this. I believe other states that are subject to biological opinions from NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service are also concluding that BLM's criteria are the only and primary tool for ensuring protection of threatened and endangered salmon species. So whether or not it's overtly stated, we're starting to see a tremendous amount of support for the BLM criteria, and I strongly believe our scientific work on the olfactory responses is a big part of that. So our investment in science is paying off with acceptance by the regulatory community. Yes, definitely, Scott. It's paying off, and we're pleased that the regulatory community is recognizing the science that we've published and presented in scientific meetings. Yeah, I've found in presentations to uh, general scientific audiences that some of those people are quite surprised to learn that the criteria do not need to be lowered and that we have very hard, indisputable evidence from our analyses that they have only heard in the past the story that the criteria need to be lowered because of all the tests that were done in laboratory waters. So I think just by going out and making these presentations, we're contacting people who have only heard one side of the story and are quite willing to hear the other side also. And as I said, the results in our papers are indisputable. When do you think the ICA, CDA will be ready to expand these symposiums and the information you've just mentioned that you've shared with the scientific community and regulators also to the media, to the outside world. And also, how is this helpful to the copper industry? If you can give me an analogy, that would be great. Well, to address your first question, instead of perhaps organizing formal symposia, It's more a matter of getting out on the stump and just going to a lot of meetings where you're seeing new people, not the same old faces, and making these presentations and just making the very simple, clear statements that we're making in this podcast. And that goes a long way to getting the message across to the scientists and the regulators. And similar activities done to general public meetings can help those uh, general public members to understand the story also. It's not a difficult rocket science challenge to communicate this message. I know we've been talking a lot about the freshwater salmon. Are there similar concerns for salmon that are in saltwater? Bob, can you speak to this a little bit? Yes, this is because many of the same water quality factors that control copper toxicity to fish are just as important to saltwater as well as freshwater fish. As a result, we maintain that saltwater criteria should be natural outgrowths of our very successful efforts with the freshwater criteria, which we've already mentioned in this podcast. So as a result, ICA and CDA began supporting and developing these saltwater criteria more than eight years ago, and this was prompted by some extremely low standards uh, being imposed in some coastal states that many stakeholders found difficult or impossible to meet. Hopefully, or as a result, we feel these criteria are quite far along and that peer review comments and the final saltwater criteria, we believe, should be released by EPA by the end of 2014 or early 2015. When you say low standards, by that do you mean stringent standards? Yes, many would consider that stringent, but basically what we're talking about is lower numbers that become more difficult to achieve when applied within a formal discharge permit or other kind of regulatory Mm -hmm. framework. So the lower the regulatory limit, the more restrictive it is. But I will say a key message that we repeat over and over again in many of these talks that we do 
is that particularly when you're using the correct Bible availability based model, the BLM, lower or higher numbers do not necessarily have a value such as more or less trenchant. They are more accurately protective of aquatic life and just reflect how copper is really toxic or whether it is not toxic in that particular situation. Yep, as long as you use the right method to calculate the number. So, Joe Meyer, what do we know about olfactory impairment in saltwater fish? Is it the same as in freshwater? Is there anything? Well, the short answer is there's not much. But NOAA scientists are currently conducting a saltwater olfactory study with salmon exposed to copper. Now, the initial results indicated that you need at least 25 times more copper than the current saltwater regulatory limit in order to impair olfaction in seawater-adapted salmon. However, NOAA is now trying a potentially more sensitive olfactory measurement and is conducting experiments in brackish water. And brackish water is just a mixture between salt content of fresh water and salt water. And NOAA is trying to see if copper might impair olfaction in salmon in bays and estuaries where fresh water and seawater mix. I should note that CDA has funded part of the NOAA saltwater study through the San Francisco Estuary Institute. And this open communication and interaction with NOAA and the Institute is an important success story for the ICA CDA science program. And I might add, Joe, mm -hmm. that we expect the results from these CDA NOAA collaborative saltwater lab studies to be available in late 2014 or early 2015. And it's worth noting that most of the olfactory studies with copper we've been discussing are in the U.S., but there's also interest outside the U.S., specifically in Canada and Europe, other evaluations on the protectiveness of the European BLM-based guidelines, including environmental quality standards derived by individual European Union member states are ongoing. And while we're at it, Joe Meyer, could you please tell us about the reception you got in your talk in this past May in Europe? I believe the title was Protectiveness of Copper Aquatic Life Criteria Guidelines Against Olfactory Impairment in Fish. It's an impressive title. Why did you present the talk in Europe, and how was this presentation received by the scientific community? Well, we need to start presenting talks in Europe because olfactory effects in general are an emerging research topic there. Now, North American researchers are starting to present their findings about copper effects on olfaction in fish at scientific meetings in Europe, and the press is publishing related articles, and European researchers are now following the lead of North American researchers by investigating the olfactory effects of metals, including copper, on fish. Now, during the 2013 and 2014 annual meetings of the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry in Europe, I presented a poster and then a talk demonstrating that the biotic ligand model-based copper limits protect against olfactory effects. Now, these presentations were co-authored by some of the other members of the Copper Olfactory Behavior Advisory Group. In general, our findings surprise some people, but I haven't received negative responses because the facts speak for themselves. Okay, well, as Joe Gorsuch had mentioned, manuscripts prepared by ICA consultants and a white paper are expected to be completed and submitted by the end of 2014 or early in 2015. And we look forward to sharing updates and new information through these studies with you. To proceed to part three, please click on the button now.